lecture in a series, the second lecture in a series of four concerning the Minneapolis strikes and the role of the Revolutionary Party, as presented by the Young Socialist uh, Summer School. And tonight, Farrell is going to speak on, uh, well, the Minneapolis strikes and the, the Communist Party. Farrell Dobbs. <coughs> Uh, comrades, in yesterday's discussion, we arrived at the point where the stage was set for a showdown battle between the Truck Drivers Union, Local 574, and the trucking bosses of Minneapolis. Tonight, I want to begin by examining some of the major aspects of the preparations for that battle, particularly as these things illustrate the decisive role of a class-conscious leadership in union struggles. The Trotskyists, who were the actual leaders of the action, had no illusions about what the union was up against. They were wholly aware from the outset that the bosses were going to refuse to deal with the union and try instead by every possible means to smash the union. They were equally aware that none of the politicians, whether or not they appeared in the guise of friends of labor, could be relied on in any way to aid and support the union as against the bosses, that the situation would be just the opposite. Also, that the general run of the official union leadership throughout the whole town would be scared to death of the action, would crumble under pressure, and would, in the last analysis, be treacherous. They were consequently fully aware that in the last analysis, the outcome of the fight would hinge on the capacity of a class conscious leadership to mobilize the workers, lead, and teach the workers in the course of the action and undertake to break through all the barriers to the unionization of the truck drivers by the power of the rank and file of the that section of the working class involved in the struggle. Let us look first at the consciousness with which the Trotskyists developed their strategy concerning relations with Governor Floyd Olson, then the executive head of the state of Minnesota. Olson was the elected candidate of the Farmer Labor Party, as it existed at that time in Minnesota. Today, the Farmer Labor Party has been fused with the Democratic Party and is called the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. And it is nothing more nor less than the Minnesota section of the Democratic Party with the name Farmer Labor Party hanging on as an appendage and without any meeting. But at that time, the Farmer Labor Party 
existed as a separate political entity in the state of Minnesota. It was basically a workers and farmers organization enjoying substantial support both in the towns and in the countryside from the working people and the working farmers, although, of course, there were numerous middle-class elements in it. It was a reformist party acting on the political arena in the name of achieving reforms for the workers and farmers under the capitalist system, and it was semi-independent of the two-party system in the sense that within the state of Minnesota, it ran its own candidates, for instance, for governor, as against both the Democrats and Republicans, but nationally, it functioned in a coalition with the Roosevelt New Deal. To a politically conscious person with a class understanding, it was therefore evident that Olson, as a farmer laborite in the governor's chair, was in a peculiar position. And to think this out in advance and know how to proceed because of this was very important to the good and welfare of the strike that was to come. On the positive side, from the point of view of the workers, was the fact that it was politically dangerous for Olson to act openly as a strike breaker. He couldn't step out as would a Democratic or Republican governor at, at that juncture within the state in, uh, in uh, crass support of the bosses and against the workers. On the other side, it was necessary to recognize in advance that in the showdown that was to come, there would be juncture after juncture in which Olson was sure to maneuver against the Union. Now, the, the contradiction was present, but so long as the Union leadership was aware of it and knew how to approach it, it became Olson's contradiction and not the Union's contradiction. And from that it followed that the problem of the Union leadership was to devise the best possible way to take advantage of Olson's contradiction. Recognizing this in advance and beginning to prepare well in advance of the actual strike, the Union leadership opened the gambit by putting Olson on record as sympathetic to the Union aim. This was done at an early stage in the spring of 1934, about six weeks after the successful coal strike and a month or so before the first general truck driver strike uh, developed in May. You recall I described to you yesterday how the volunteer organizers that had come out of the coal yards and had been victimized by the bosses after the strike was won had been out working both sides of the street all over town, organizing drivers and inside workers, and holding meetings with them in which the workers had a voice in shaping the demands that were going to be presented to the bosses. As this general momentum developed, it became appropriate and necessary and possible to hold a general organization mass meeting. For the purpose, the union rented for a night a downtown theater. 
and got out a lot of publicity. Now, by the way, here's a little factor that will, in another sense, illustrate the difference between the politically conscious factors that are now in Local 574 and the old line leadership. The organizing committee went before the union executive board and asked for an appropriation to pay a printer to get out a batch of leaflets advertising this organization meeting to summon the workers to this theater. And one of the members of the executive board said, what do you want money for leaflets for? These guys all know where our headquarters is and they know we've been here for years and if they want to come down, they'll come down. Why we got to spend good union money to have a printer tell these guys where we're at? <laughs> this was just typical <laughs> of the mentality we were running up against. Well, we got the appropriation, got the leaflet out, held the meeting. And a formal invitation was extended to Governor Olson to appear at the meeting. And he accepted the invitation. And the leaflet announced that Governor Olson would speak. Now, he didn't turn up. But here you begin to see how the contradiction in Olson operated to the union's benefit, where you had a conscious leadership. Olson couldn't just stay away. So he sent a letter to the meeting. And we had him on record in, in even better form than if he had made an oral presentation at the meeting itself. Because it was right there on the official letterhead of the governor of the sovereign state of Minnesota, signed Floyd B. Olson, in which he, in a careful and cautious way, but nevertheless with sufficient positiveness, to serve the necessary advantages, gave approbation and approval to what the workers were asking, what they were striving to do. Now, as I say, the conscious leadership was wholly aware that this couldn't be taken at face value, but it helped in various ways from time to time as the going got rough in the battles that were to come, and particularly when Olson would begin to maneuver and wiggle around and do some pretty desperately drastic things in an effort to get out of the contradiction he was caught in. That was one aspect of the preparation. Now let's look at it from another point of view. What concretely did it mean when we say that the union leadership was wholly conscious from the outset this was going to be a showdown fight with no holes barred? How was this reflected in the other aspects of the preparation for the battle? First, let me make the generalization that everything about the physical preparations for the strike were calculated to demonstrate to the bosses, to the workers, to the politicians, to all the union bureaucrats around town that the union meant business. We began the truck driver strike, their mobile strikes, we began by renting a huge garage. It was about a block long and probably as wide as two-thirds the, the distance from here to there, this building. Equipped so that the picket cars could drive in and out, which was necessary for a series of reasons. Within the headquarters, a commissary was established where the strikers could be fed on a mass basis. Before the strike began, 
thinking in terms of the probability of a siege. Relief committees were organized within the Union to go out and chisel groceries from friendly merchants, go and explain the facts of life to landlords that had to depend on the working class for their rent when they got too tough with a striker about his rent, and to see that strikers who deserved help got it, and at the same time to safeguard the union against chiselers and freeloaders. And these relief committees came right out of the ranks of the union. In addition to the facilities for the mobilization and dispatching of the pickets, the commissary and the relief committees we erected a hospital in the strike headquarters and secured the services of two doctors and three trained nurses who on a virtually volunteer basis functioned on full time in the headquarters once the action got underway and the hospital began to be used. And we had another situation that is of particular interest. We found as the action got underway that the cops had our telephone lines tapped. They had police spies around in one and another way, shape, and form. And when we first began to dispatch pickets, receive calls from a picket detachment in trouble with the cops out someplace or to dispatch pickets to some place where we found that an outfit was trying to operate that shouldn't, we learned that the cops would be there ahead of us. It didn't take as long for that. Uh, they, they, they had, uh, by the uh, device of tapping our phone and other means, this inside information. So there was a particular contingent of volunteers that turned up in the strike that we organized into a courier service. They were the counterpart in 1934 of the young men and women you see all dressed up in the garb for the occasion that ride motorcycles. The equivalent of the packs that were dramatized in that picture that Marlon Brando played, and I forget the name of the picture, the wild ones. These were the wild ones of 1934. They turned to, and, and we had the most magnificent kind of a courier service. Uh, in addition... Well, tonight, to the picketing detachments, uh, we had picketing marshals stationed at various areas around town in the, in the uh, strategic places, and our couriers passed back and forth between the marshals out in the field and the general staff at the headquarters, bringing in reports and taking back orders. And they enjoyed to the full the action that young people of that kind have an instinctive yearning for, and in the process they made a substantial contribution to a first-class social cause. The small difference between what happens to youth when class struggle is in the air and what happens to youth when the whole atmosphere is permeated with reaction and everything that is reprehensible about capitalist society, as is the case today. In addition to the couriers, the Union quickly developed an intelligence service once the action began. And here, spontaneity came to the fore in a very remarkable form. We enjoyed a striking demonstration of solidarity 
from girls of working class families who were employed as stenographers and secretaries in the offices of the bosses. We began to get anonymous mail at the strike headquarters. Sometimes it was obvious that a boss had dictated a letter and the stenographer had just slipped an extra carbon in <laughs> that the boss hadn't specified and that used his stationery and his stamp <laughs> to mail it to the strike headquarters. <laughs> Other times we'd get, a, uh, we'd get a piece of paper that obviously it had been all crumpled up and thrown in a wastebasket. It would show all those signs, but it would have been smoothed out, carefully folded, and addressed anonymously to the strike headquarters. And as you can see, in more ways than one, we were able to look down the boss's throats because some of this anonymous intelligence that was coming to us was coming right out of the headquarters of the Citizens Alliance itself, the central boss organization that I described briefly to you last night that was ramrodding the whole thing from the point of view of the bosses. <coughs> In the development of the picking, as I say, it was a mobile strike for all the circumstances that are attendant upon the nature of the trucking industry, and it was, in fact, one of the initial cases of the development of the flying squadrons, which became strikingly prevalent during the great surge of the CIO in basic industry that was to come later. I won't attempt too much to discuss the flying squads right at this point because you're going to meet them several times in the course of this evening out in action. And I think it'll begin to give you a pretty good feel of uh, what a flying squadron meant. Let us then turn to a brief look at responsiveness in support of the strike from other areas in the working class of the town. Unorganized workers, not in maximum numbers, but in significant numbers, from virtually every quarter of such industry as there was around town, turned to as volunteers to help. And it was a very common thing for workers who were on jobs that are not in any way involved in the strike to put in their whole day at work and then come down and spend the whole night either doing night picketing when things were quiet in order to spell off the drivers themselves so that they could concentrate more on the on the daytime picketing when the when the job was the toughest or to help around the strike headquarters and maybe be working in the commissary and along about four o'clock in the morning when they'd done everything that they could do they'd stretch out on one of the tables was used to feed the strikers and get a couple of hours sleep on those boards and get up and go and put in another day's work come quitting time they're right back again at the strike headquarters. This was not at all uncommon among workers who had jobs, but were in, in uh, areas of employment around town that weren't directly involved in the strike. Yet another category was the unemployed workers, who had been waging their own battle in one and another form, which is a story in itself that we can't go into without getting too far afield from the main theme of the general subject before us. And they were like the Negro masses today. They had everything to gain and damn little or nothing to lose. And they turned to in the strike with a will. And some of them proved to be some of the best fighters in the actions that were to come. Then the question of the farms. We had a problem with the farmers in the first of the general truck strikes from which we learned a lesson and we made the necessary correction and when we came to the second 
general battle, we had the farmers solidly on our side. What was involved primarily was truck farmers in the general vicinity of the city who brought their fruit, their berries, their vegetables, and one thing and another down into the market area where a substantial uh, space was stalled off and the stalls were rented to the truck farmers and they would come early in the morning with their truckloads of produce. Uh, you should keep in mind that at that time the chain stores hadn't evolved to the point they have today and the small corner grocery where people did their training was, uh, tra trading was much more prevalent and the small grocer would come down about six o'clock in the morning and meet the truck farmer coming in and backing his truck into his allotted stall in the market and the grocer would pick up his fruit and his uh, green stuff for the day's sales. And since some of the major fighting, or a matter of fact in the first strike, the major fighting was going to take place right in this area, we, without intending to, without wanting to, we actually strangled the, the truck farmers uh, for a period from carrying out their, uh, their necessary uh, trade with the, uh, with the grocers. Of course, the bosses wanted this. This is one of the places where, it was, uh, it was one of the few places, I think I can honestly say, but it was one of the places where at the outset they thought just a little bit ahead of us. And in the first battle, there was quite a little antagonism developed against the Union. But we learned a lesson from it. And when we came to the second strike, in advance of the strike, through small farmers organizations such as one called the, the, the Farm Holiday Association, which was the counterpart at that time of what the National Farm Organization is that's beginning to gestate today, through organizations such as that, we came to an arrangement with the truck farmers. And the union got, took over at least a big parking lot and, and gave the, uh, the farmers stalls in there without rent, unlike what they had down in the regular market. And when we got into the second strike, the farmers came to the union-provided uh, marketplace, and the grocers came there, and the battle went on someplace else, and they paid no attention. And to show their appreciation, they went a long ways toward helping us keep the strike commissary stocked. It was very helpful. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, as the preparations of this kind and responses of this kind became manifest and the first actions in the strike began, it was so inspiring that even some of the union bureaucrats responded. One of me was a business agent of the plumbers union. He hadn't done a day's work for quite a while. He'd been eating very high on the hog. And he was, well, shall I say, somewhat on the portly side. Yet he got so picked up by what was happening that lo and behold, he digs his old plumber's kit out of the mothballs, puts on an oversized pair of coveralls, and turns to it the strike headquarters and starts fixing the leaks <laughs> in the spigots and the sink and the commissary. <laughs> but these were the exception of the rule. I say it to do justice to them. The general theme among the union bureaucrats was to be apprehensive about all this preparation for battle. It would be kind of like a, like a pacifist who says, well, it's all right, you know, to mobilize an army and even put union uniforms on them and teach them how to march. But when you give them guns, that's going too far. <laughs> now, we weren't giving out guns. But we were making it crystal clear that this army is being mobilized to fight by the best means it can commensurate with the situation that workers find themselves in, in a class struggle under capitalist rule, where all the edges are on the boss's side. And this scared the union bureaucrats, and they put just the opposite emphasis that the leadership of Local 574 did on the question of Olson. Their theme was, let Olson lead. Don't do all this that you're doing. Don't go out of here and pick fights with the cops, as we were accused of doing. We were beginning to scuffle with the cops, as you will see, but uh, we weren't picking fights. They asked for it. 
Let Olson lead. He's labor's friend. And at every turn, when Olson maneuvered against the strike, and as we progress tonight, I'll show you some of the main maneuvers, what they, the dangers that they contained within them and how they were fought off, they apologized for Olson. And at every juncture in the showdown fights that were to come, when, when, when what amounted to a civil war on the streets developed, they blocked all efforts that were raised by workers and other unions to declare sympathy strikes with the truck drivers. That was the real role of the bureaucrats. <clears throat> As of the beginning of the strike in May, proceeding from the outset with the kind of an organized structure that I have briefly described to you, The drivers, supporting workers, unorganized from other industries, the unemployed, the strikers and all the friends of the strikers within the ranks of the working class of the city turned to by the thousands. We began to organize our flying squadrons, stationary picket lines here and there, started policing the trucking industry of the town. And the first day was really something. These strikers had no experience. For the overwhelming majority of the workers involved, they had never before had an experience of this kind in any way, shape, or form. And picture the scene. Never before had there been this kind of a battle in this town. Never before had the workers had an experience Nobody except the most conscious leadership in the strike had the remotest idea what's about to happen. So here's all these thousands of pickets out. And wherever they found a truck, they did the only thing that come naturally. They brought it to the strike headquarters and asked for orders of what to do. Within three or four hours after the truck opened, that was a bedlam around that headquarters. There were truckloads of hogs and cattle, <laughs> <laughs> loads of cold milk wagons. You know, you know, I told you about these tea and coffee drivers who went out and peddled tea and coffee and salves and the farmer's almanac. Some of those standing around there. Everything they brought in. Well, after about 24 hours, we got that, we got that straightened out. And uh, the situation began to stabilize. <laughs> The biggest trouble we were having was with the newspapers. And I think it won't come as a surprise to you when I tell you the newspapers were somewhat misrepresenting the strike. The workers didn't like it. And moreover, they were trying to run trucks out to deliver these lying papers under police protection. So we, uh, we de designated, the, the, uh, the picket dispatchers designated what was intended to be a vigilance picket line. We didn't think it was quite appropriate to join the first issue right here. But the pickets took it their own hands, and they descended on what was called Newspaper Alley, a certain street there where all the newspapers were one next to another and the trucks were loaded. Uh, there were what they called independent truck owners that worked in cons various construction uh, projects. I had these little two-and-a-half-ton trucks that haul sand and gravel and stuff like that. They were very handy. You know, you could, you could load, uh, oh, from 20 to uh, 35 pickets into the back end of one of those, depending on how urgent it was to get a lot of people there in a hurry. In this kind of a strike, you know, in, in uh, many cases... Uh, you follow the maximum of Forrest, the, uh, the uh, Confederate uh, cavalry commander in the Civil War. It says, <laughs> says the, the main uh, law in cavalry tactics is that the one that wins is the one that gets there the fustest with the mostest. <laughs> and, and this was the factor that was present in the transportation of pickets. They descend upon Newspaper Alley, and the cops reinforce themselves the newspapers had a gang of, uh, of private cops from the Burns Detective Agency, and they proceeded to work over the pickets and gave quite a few of them a beating, men and women. Up to this point in the preliminary stages, not only the, uh, not only the strikers, 
But the wives of strikers, women working in other industries, there were very few women employed except in office work in the trucking industry, had been on the picket line. And they beat women just as mercilessly as they beat men. After this experience, in the situation that was quickly to follow, in which the fighting got really brutal, the division of labor was such that it fell to the men to constitute the picket detachments, and the women formed themselves into supporting forces that functioned in a whole series of ways. Once every man was needed on the picket line, the women immediately took over the commissary. The women immediately took over the general staffing of the relief committees. They took over the, the auxiliary functions of helping the doctors in the, and the nurses in the hospital, which in the strike headquarters, which by now um, is, is becoming uh, uh, very necessary. When in the second strike we launched the strike daily that I will speak about later, the women played a very big role in all of the tasks attendant upon the production of that paper and especially in the distribution of the paper. And at various crucial points in the strike, when, when uh, the battle was very rough, and the Union found itself in one or another kind of a crisis, the women organized themselves in, in very impressive forces and made demonstrations before City Hall, barged in in force into the office of the mayor, into the council chamber, into the office of the chief of the police, went over to the state capitol in St. Paul and gave the governor and the state legislature the same treatment. In short, just raised hell generally with the authorities because of the, because of the situation they were, they were letting the bosses precipitate, or more accurately, helping the bosses to precipitate, or even more actively, carrying out for the bosses at the boss's order. In addition to that, as the newspapers continued to lie about the strike, the women would form uh, uh, demonstrations in front of the newspaper buildings and let one and all who could hear in any quarter know that those rags they're printing upstairs there are lying about our strike. In, in, uh, in ways of that kind, there was a tremendous and a vital solidarity between the men and the women in the strike. And it's an important thing to take note of not only in the mass movement, but in all sectors of the labor movement, including and above all, in the conscious revolutionary party of the working class. Labor, in whatever form, its organization at the given juncture, never in the last analysis has a really solid and complete and wholly undetached member until it has both the husband and the wife. And in the ways I've sought briefly to indicate this was demonstrated to the hilt in this strike by the solidarity of the men and women. It was not just the truck drivers who was on strike, it was the families of the truck drivers that were on strike. And the women weren't sitting at home grousing because the men weren't bringing home dough to pay the grocer and the landlord. In one way or another, they were out there helping in the battle. And the response there was just as broad, just as general, and just as complete as it was among the men in the strike. <clears throat> right after this attack on the pickets in Newspaper Row that I just described, open preparations began for what was to culminate about three days, four days later in what is known as the Battle of Deputy Run. Right 
Right after the attack in newspaper row, the newspapers themselves opened a big blast on the criminal anarchy of the strike, on the Reds that were leading it, on these outside agitators that ought to go back to Russia, about how these poor misguided truck drivers who never had it so good in their life were being led down the garden path, as the British say. And the mayor announced that he was going to re begin recruiting special deputies to enforce law and order. We didn't have television in those days, but they did have radio. And every hour on the hour, Saturday, all day Sunday, the latest bulletin would be announced as to how many deputies the chief of police had sworn in. And along about the shank of the evening on Sunday, the figure they were announcing over the radio had climbed above 2,000. And all day Sunday, they had begun to announce that in the enforcement of law and order, that the delivery of all forms of merchandise in the city of Minneapolis was going to be restored to normal come Monday morning, the beginning of the work week. This was the preparation from the boss's side. At the strike headquarters, <coughs> the striker's reaction to the attack in newspaper row, the mood of the strikers, the recognition of the workers of the need for and their manifest determination to go through with a showdown fight took form along these lines. Along toward the latter part of the afternoon on Saturday, a police prowl car pulled up in front of the strike headquarters, two cops in it. They jump out with their club in hand, their coats pulled back from their holstered revolver so there'll be nothing in the way of reaching for it. And with all the impudence and authority of a cop, they charge into the headquarters announcing they've got a report that some truck driver's been kidnapped and either he's going to be turned over right here and now or they're going to jail the, the uh, strike leadership. Just about two minutes and 32 seconds by the clock later, these same two cops are laying out on the sidewalk in front of the headquarters waiting for an ambulance to take them to the hospital. <laughs> this was the first, first response that showed the mood. As a matter of fact, I recall one scene. There were so many workers in that headquarters anxious to get at those cops that they slug one another a few times and on trying to reach over one another's shoulder to hit the cops. I remember one big ice wagon driver. He was, a, oh, he was a big, strong man, and he's tall. And he's reaching over two other pickets to try to bash the cop over the head with an improvised club. And in the scuffle, he got moved, and he broke the arm of one of the pickets in front of him. And he broke down and cried. And like the old man that married at night, he not for love but for spite, he was crying more for the fact he had missed the cup than he was that he broke his fellow picket's arm. <laughs> that was the mood. <clears throat> Saturday night, all day Sunday, the union, the rank and file of the strike, are preparing to see that law and order is upheld working class style come the opening of the work week on Monday. You look around the headquarters, and here you'll find the worker he's brought his garden hose. He's got a pair of tin shears, and he's cutting the garden hose up into about 14-inch lengths. Another one has come in with a couple of big bags of washers and a few, a 
few rolls of, uh, of uh, friction tape. And they take the washers and they tamp them all inch to an inch and a half thickness of washers into the end of the hose, wrap tape around it so that the washers won't fly out, put a little tape around the other end for a handle. You know, it makes a pretty good improvised blackjack, extended style. Another detachment goes down the switch yards and they start cutting the hoses, the air hoses, <laughs> off, the, off the freight cars, uh, uh, on the sidings in, in the yards. Here comes a worker not in the strike, but for the strike down the street with his son's coaster wagon. Got stakes on the side. What do they call them? Noodle posts that you have, you know, from the first and second floor of the house. And they were, they were just right for clubs. So he'd got a saw and he'd sawed all these posts <laughs> out, of, out of the stair railing, had them, had them ricked up in the kid's coaster wagon, brought them down, donation to the strike. Um, members of the carpenter's union Turn two on Sunday, no overtime, and uh, brought with them a big batch of two by twos, and worked like beavers sawing these two by twos up in the clubs. Well, by Monday morning, the uh, the uh, truck drivers were well enough to equip to, as they say, at least get a lunch while the cops were getting a meal. And with this came Monday. Now, I want to make something clear, and it's important. There's been quite a bit written about the Battle of Deputy Run, and the general tendency of the modern newspaper reporter that writes about this, or author of a book, as the case may be, there have been some, is to telescope the whole thing into the clash which took place on Tuesday where two deputies got killed. Now, it's important to clarify this because it carries the connotation that the attitude of the harness bulls, that is the regular uniform cops, on, on the Tuesday, the day of the Battle of Deputy Run, was their attitude in the whole fight. That just is not so. Actually, the main fight and, and the most vital fight took place on Monday. Come Monday morning, here's practically the whole uniform police department mobilized down in the market area. They're going to move one truck uh, away from one of the large vegetable and produce houses. And they've got deputies there by the hundreds. It was quite a bit of law congregated around the place. And the truck drivers and their allies <coughs> turned to an equal force. Now, first of all, this fight on Monday was mainly, insofar as the forces involved were concerned, the truck drivers against the cops and the deputies. Secondly, what happened was that the minute the fighting started, and I won't go into the details of how it started, but the minute the fighting started, and it became clear that the truck drivers are going to stand their ground and defend themselves against the police attack on their picket lines as best they could, the deputies cut and run. And it became a stand-up fight between the truck drivers and the regular uniform cops. Well, we filled the headquarters hospital with truck driver casualties that day, but also the truck drivers put over 50 cops in the hospital. And this became a symbol of the changing situation. And the upshot of it was that the day's fight came to a draw and they abandoned trying to pull out that truck. I might give you, there's one other factor that helps illustrate the value of the flying squadron. There was one point, it was generally club against club. There was no shooting by the cops on that day. The shooting won't come until the second strike. It was generally club against club, but there was one tight point, just as the fighting was coming to its climax, where the cops drew their guns. 
And they were sort of, they'd worked themselves into an area where they were pretty well congregated, and they had a perimeter of clear fire against the truck drivers. Now, on this day, unlike Tuesday, it was the kind of a fight where you could execute a little tactical maneuver here and there during the strike, and we saw the, uh, during the fight. And when we saw what the situation was, we checkmated the cops when they pulled their guns by throwing three or four truckloads of pickets into the middle of the thing, putting drivers in that were the kind of guys that would carry out their orders, and the order was don't stop for anything and don't stop until you've driven right into the middle of this gang of cops. The object was the pickets poured out of the trucks in, am uh, in among the cops, and now the cops couldn't fire without risk of shooting themselves. That is, they'd lost their, their clear perimeter of fire, and we'd, we'd checkmated the guns. And it was, it was this action that sort of settled the thing for the day. The police chief ordered the truck brought back in. Now, they hadn't given up, but they had decided they'll come back tomorrow, and they'll try to be prepared to handle what they had met and couldn't handle on Monday. Well, you can imagine how the newspapers appeared that night. You can imagine what the radio broadcasts were, and it wasn't exactly a surprise to anybody around town. The next day, come sunrise, there's already <laughs> people all over the market getting grandstand seats, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, ra the main radio station has got a panel truck down there with a... a done like, like we sometimes do with our street meetings. They put a platform up on top of the panel truck and had, had it lashed on there, had, a, had an announcer sitting up there in a chair strapped onto the platform with a microphone in front of him. He's going he's gonna to give one of Murrow's You Are There <laughs> accounts of, of what's going to take place on, on Tuesday in the market. And uh, <clears throat> with the... Uh, passage of the morning, people come more and more by the thousands. The law is there again in full force in terms of the regular cops, and the deputies are back. Finally comes the preparations to move the truck, and the tension was so great that what started the fighting well, this time was not a, a, a move against the pickets by the cops, as it happened on Monday, to try to break a picket line in order to, uh, in order to uh, uh, get the truck through. What started the fighting was that some prankster, probably had a grievance against this particular company, found a crate of oranges out on the sidewalk, and he picked it up and hurled it through a plate glass window of one of the one of the marketplaces. And the crash and the sound of the falling glass is all it took, you know. To just trigger the whole thing. And then within a matter of minutes, it was Katie bar the door. Now, it turned out that the regular cops, the harness bulls, resented the way the deputies had run the day before. And before long, a tacit understanding developed between the pickets and the cops that if the pickets didn't go directly toward the cops in the battle that was to happen. The cops wouldn't break their necks going to the aid of the special deputies if the pickets went in that direction. There was no negotiation. It was just one of those things that happens with a, in a split second in a, in a uh, crisis. It, it, was the, it was, in a way, somewhat parallel of the description Trotsky gives in the history of the Russian Revolution of the symbolism of uh, the way the worker ducked under the horse of the Cossack, and the Cossack winked. And with that, the workers began just going beyond the Cossacks and going after the Pharaohs. You remember the passage in the history. Uh, it, it, was, it was the counterpart of that. And in the fighting that followed, it wasn't so much a matter of the deputies standing and fighting as it was that they got mousetrapped. They got surrounded. We looked over the ground during the night. We had noticed where they ran the day before, and we closed off a couple of uh, 
what P.T. Barnum called egresses. And they couldn't run as fast as they could before, and they began to get worked over. And these wealthy men from Lowry Hill, the residential district of the big money in town at that time, these these uh, well-to-do sportsmen that thought they were going to come down and have a holiday beating truck drivers over the head in the name of law and order. One of them come down with a polo hat on. He got the polo hat pounded into his head. He didn't fare so well. As a matter of fact, two of them got killed that day. And plenty of them got hospitalized. And before long, they were ripping off their deputy badges. They were dropping their clubs. They were doing everything that they could do to try to find anonymity. They no longer wanted to be recognized as deputies. And the pickets uh, not only cleaned them out of the market, they chased them for blocks in every direction. <clears throat> this brought to a climax the attempt at this juncture to break the strike by smashing the, police, the uh, picket lines through police force. And what happened was that a truce developed. As a matter of fact, the sheriff at one juncture late that day uh, came forward as the intermediary and an understanding was arrived at which it is true limited the number of pickets that would be on the street but what was different was it also limited the number of cops that would be on the street. It, it was a a negotiated truce. In short, there was a stalemate. Now, in a sense, you stop and think about this for a moment, you're seeing what amounts to a fleeting instant of dual power. In a strike, in a battle taking place right on the streets of a city in the United States of America. <clears throat> it could be only an instant because of all the features I sought to describe to you yesterday that made this exceptional. It could be only a demonstration of what that kind of class power led and used on a national scale could have accomplished but it could accomplish nothing more than to safeguard the Union from the attack and permit the truck drivers to go forward in their battle to establish their Union. Only a Union contract was possible, but right then and there, at that moment, in that key fight, the thing happened that was to change the whole character of that town. From that moment, it was on the way from an open shop town to a union town. At least that much was accomplished. It still had to be cinched up. That, that victory that was won by the truck drivers that day, and it was a tremendous victory to reach a stalemate in a stand-up fight with the organized police force of a town had to be defended against new attacks on it, but that was the beginning of the victory. <clears throat> now, while this is going on, a telegram arrives at the Union headquarters, signed by Daniel J. Tobin, the General President of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters ordering us to arbitrate our differences with the bosses. We were busy down in the market. There was a screwball congressman, my name was Shoemaker, wandering around trying to get some publicity for himself, and he wanders into the strike headquarters, and here he sees laying on the table, there's hardly anybody around, we're all down in the market, he sees laying on the table here a telegram from Tobin addressed to Bill Brown, the President of the Union, ordering to arbitrate. The well, shoemaker was just that kind of a screwball. He took it upon himself to answer this 
He answered in the right spirit, but here's what he wired back to Tobin, and he signed Bill Brown's name to it. Dear sir, keep your scabby nose and scaly face out. This is a fight for human rights, your rat job not involved. Well, as you can understand, it didn't exactly improve our relations with Tobin. <laughs> even though, it, even though it, did, it did echo the reality of the moment. But what had happened was that the workers had enforced their own law as against the capitalist legal structure and a stalemate had been arrived at and some negotiations had to take place. The bosses still wouldn't meet the union directly, so Olson came in as the mediator. And through his mediation, an agreement was arrived at that gave recognition to the union, established an increase in pay and other conditions. It wasn't the best contract in the world, but it was a start, and the strike was settled. The strike is no more than settled, and the strikers return to work, and we find we've been double-crossed by Olson. Remember I told you there's drivers and inside workers. What Olson had done, it turned out, apparently, was to tell us that the recognition was for both drivers and inside workers, and he told the bosses it was for drivers only. Now you can see what, what was involved here. The aim was to split the union ranks. Get us off the streets, the workers back on the job, and now the drivers had recognition and increases in pay, provisions for hours and so on. They figured you wouldn't be able to get them back out again and the inside workers would go by the board. That would have been more than half of the union. This would enable them also to keep the union pretty much restricted to the narrow craft structure that was safe for the bureaucrats and for reformist politicians like Olson and would lay the foundation for them to try to clean out the radicals in the leadership of the union and restore the status quo ante. That was the scheme. Now before I come to the next point, I've been talking just about an hour. It'll take another half to a three quarters of an hour to go through the second strike. What is your what is your judgment? Shall I go part way and then we take telescope a little more tomorrow? Or shall I finish the second strike tonight? Okay. Now we come to the question that was asked about the Communist Party, the Stalinists. It is at this juncture that the Stalinists make their first major attack on the strike leadership. They used for that device a man by the name of William F. Dunn, the elder of the Dunn brothers, blood brother to Vincent, Grant, and Raymond, who were three of the foremost uh, leaders in the strike, but who, unlike them, had stayed in the Communist Party and supported Stalin in the split that took place in 1928, whereas Ray and Miles and Grant had gone with the Trotskyist cadre. They come out with a pamphlet entitled Counter-Revolution in Minneapolis. Now, what was one of the central points that it shows you what kind of renegades and reformists and traitors of the working class we are, that we hadn't gone right on and seized power and extended power as of the culmination of the Battle of Deputy Run. And there were all kinds of additions, but that was the, the essence of it and, and gives you the, uh, the central feel of the situation. At that time, the Communist Party was in its third period, as it was called. When the whole norm of their procedure was to try to substitute the vanguard for the mass in simulated <coughs> class actions and advance the most extreme demands in those struggles. Where they had taken the militants of the Communist Party out of the established unions 
and tried to build what they called a red trade union international. And where all they had succeeded in doing was in isolating the militants of the Communist Party from the masses and pursuing a policy that made it impossible for them to make fusion with the spontaneous masses at that point in struggle in any way, shape, or form. Now, they had no influence in the truck drivers' union. As a matter of fact, the leadership of the union had to protect them from the strikers. It was a kind of a mixed reaction on the part of the Trotskyists because this is now six years after the split in 1928. And following the split in 1928, down through those years, the Communist Party had been sending goon squads to break up Trotskyist meetings. They had barged into meetings like this, rushed in and beat up people in the hall. Objectively, that would have been wrong because it's the last thing in the world that should be done is to lend yourself on a factional basis in any way, shape, or form to the idea that, that differences of opinion, differences of line within the working class are going to be resolved by, uh, by uh, physical force or that, uh, that uh, the exercise of the democratic rights of anybody within the labor movement are going to be proscribed by acts of violence. The only time that it is justified to use persuasive argument that sometimes takes on physical connotations is when somebody's playing the role of a strike breaker, when he's crossing class lines and acting in support of the bosses in one or another form as against the workers. And the upshot of it was that the Communist Party was unable to have any influence on the strike, <coughs> unable in any way to turn the, the uh, membership against the strike leadership, just the opposite. Now, in fact, <coughs> we had a new kind of problem for us. Olson's double cross had forced us into what was to become yet another general truck driver's strike, and as you'll see, an even rougher one than that that I have just uh, described to you. This strike that's coming now posed some new strategic and tactical problems for the leadership. It was necessary to assume from the outset the probability of new and more vicious forms of police violence, namely gunfire, in the next strike. It was necessary to expect in advance new forms of treachery against the Union through the maneuvers of Olson with the backing of the Union bureaucrats. It was necessary to find a way to keep the drivers solidarized with the inside workers within 574 and to mobilize general labor support for renewal of the struggle. And it was necessary also to get this new stage of conflict on the road to begin now some consolidations of the changed structural form of Local 574 that had been taking place during the strike. And take the latter point first. An ever tighter organizational liaison between the membership and the leadership was forged now based on mutual understanding, confidence, and trust between membership and leadership as it had been forged in battle in the May strike. A democratic internal strike structure 
was now developed that became a very potent instrument in the next stage of the battle that is before us. The small organizing committee that was selected democratically as a sort of an executive committee of the larger volunteer organizing committee that had done the mobilizing of the workers generally before the May strike became constituted as what was in actuality the central leadership of the strike. The organizing committee as the central leadership in turn functioned in close liaison with a strike committee of 100. The strike committee of 100 was not just a happen chance body of 100 people. It was democratically selected, adjusted, staffed, restaffed by the strikers themselves in the course of the struggle. It began with a selection of a hundred among those who had proven themselves the best in the May strike. And as the battle went on, it was adjusted some again by the strikers. That strike committee of 100 was genuinely representative of the ranks of the strikers as a whole. In a, in a uh, broad sense, this organizational internal structure of the democratic function within the ranks of this striking union was analogous to our concept in the Socialist Workers' Party of the selection of our central leading body, the National Committee. Nobody can get on the National Committee of the Socialist Workers' Party without getting the votes in the ranks. Nobody can butter up a leader and get pushed into, a, in, into the National Committee. They have to get the votes in the ranks, and there's only one way you can get the votes in the ranks, and that is to conduct yourself in such a way that the members conclude you'd make a good leader. And in that sense, this strike committee of 100, forged in the heat of battle, was somewhat analogous to the more deliberate, conscious way in which the Socialist Workers' Party selects its, uh, its central leading body. Now, secondly, within this strike committee of 100, a strong cadre of secondary leaders emerged in the test of fire in the battles that were to come. And as you'll see at one juncture when we were getting one of Olson's double crosses, they played a crucial role in saving the strike. They proved their worth time and again. And it was precisely from among these secondary leaders that developed out of the strike committee of 100 during the heat of battle that some of the staunchest and most solid members of the Socialist Workers' Party came that were recruited in the heat of those struggles. <clears throat> in addition to that, frequent membership meetings were held. Whether or not the union was on strike, on strike or off. And at the membership meetings there was always full and free discussion. None of this business of the membership gathering and the chairman doing most of the talking, some official, some bureaucrat from the platform having to say so, and the workers sitting there and listening. There was full and free discussion. Moreover, during the strikes, the ranks were kept up to date by daily reports over a loudspeaker system installed in the strike headquarters. Generally, in the evening after the day's work was over, uh, it became a tendency that the, uh, the workers would stay around for a while after the, after the evening meal in the strike commissary and, and uh, one and another, uh, not always the leaders, sometimes uh, a marshal of some particular picket detachment or maybe again the head of the commissary committee would be giving, up, they were giving them hell because they weren't bringing their dishes back to the sink after they got through eating. But, but uh, in one way or another, every night, over the loudspeaker, anybody who wanted to stay around would be brought right up to the minute. 
Comments would be made about what the newspapers had said in their columns and their editorials that day. Some statement some labor faker had made would be answered by one of the leaders, or some something Olson had been pop, had been popping off about would be analyzed, and the workers would be uh, clarified uh, about it. Then, in the second strike, we developed one of the most crucial instruments of all. A daily strike paper it was called the Organizer. And this became vital in this second battle. And the workers appreciated it, they learned from it, and they were proud of it. Were they proud that their union comes out with a paper and we got guys on our side that can write just as good and even write better and unlike than those guys on the daily papers and unlike them they write the truth. And the workers, as I mentioned before, mainly the women carried the load, but the, the strikers and their supporters as a whole were enthusiastic uh, backers of the paper. And we raised enough money to keep a daily one-page tabloid going throughout the whole six-odd week period of the second strike, and even a little money to buy a few things for the commissary and one thing or another. By the device of the, of the strikers, their wives, their supporters, going out with a bundle of the daily organizer and a can. We didn't charge anything for the paper, but every time you give somebody a paper, you hold a can. And you'd be surprised how many times somebody would shove a $5 bill, even in 1934, when a $5 bill was a lot more money, relatively, than it is today. And uh, you would find people driving from in the evening from all parts of town, down by the strike headquarters, for the express purpose of picking up a copy of the organizer. And we developed quite a substantial circulation and became a very vital instrument for the union in the, uh, in the whole strike and was far from the least of the vanguard contributions that was made in that battle of the instrumentalities that make it possible to carry, on, carry forward a, uh, a battle in the way it ought to be carried forward. Also, the whole party was mobilized in support. Of the, of the party fraction leading the action in Minneapolis. Comrade Cannon, the national secretary of the party, came to Minneapolis and stayed right there and performed his central leadership function in the party by acting first and foremost right at the scene of action to do everything possible to, to mobilize the support of the party as a whole. Highly skilled writers one or two of whom today have got uh, uh, very good jobs in, in the, in the uh, editorial stable of one or another of the big weekly magazines, wrote on the Daily Organizer in, uh, in 1934. The party sent unemployed organizers who had had experience in Pennsylvania and Ohio and in California and in Michigan and in other areas and to help us with the organization, the tightening of the liaison uh, for the mobilization of the unemployed in, uh, in support of the, uh, of the second strike. In short, it was an all-sighted demonstration of a combat party in action. A, a democratically centralized party acting as a compact unit, as a single force with a single purpose, with a single policy, and that within the framework of a combat formation, the truck drivers and inside workers of Minneapolis, who are organized in a democratic internal union structure along lines akin to democratic centralism, where in every respect there was democracy in deciding, but there was discipline in action. The leadership had unquestioned authority during combat. When we were clashing with the cops, or as later with the National Guard, any time a leader of the strike gave an order, it had to be carried out. There was no two ways about it. And if somebody in the ranks objected to carrying out, the leaders didn't have to discipline him. The rest of the ranks did. But the other side of it was... And in these regular reports and in these frequent membership meetings where there was full and democratic discussion that I mentioned to you, the policies of the leadership in the battles 
were subject to review and criticism by the membership. And in this, you had a limited preview of future actions to be led by our vanguard party in the great class struggles that are to come. And when you think of it in these terms, you begin to get a real concrete understanding of what we mean when we say we're out to organize a loyal, disciplined, Leninist-type combat party that functions on the democratic working class principles of democratic centralism. Here you have an image of what it's all about as it occurred at this brief but significantly important moment in the history of class struggle in the United States and in the history of the intervention of the Socialist Workers' Party in class struggle. Now, as I said, another problem we had was to mobilize general labor support for this new showdown with the boss.